Many thanks uh, for inviting me, and um, uh, good to see that uh, so many people made it this morning after the uh, extended beer this afternoon, uh, last evening. Um, so um, I want, with the a bit baroque title, talk about uh, why uh, NLP methods are not uh, used more often in the classroom. Uh, but before I begin, I want to say that um, only the tiniest bit of what I'm presenting I have practically done myself. Uh, it would not have been possible uh, without my team at Hagen and uh, a lot of external collaborators uh, who were partly former lab members. Um, so they did most of the work. Um, and the motivation uh, why I want to talk about this topic, it's a uh, as so often a personal one, whoever is in academia and has to do some grading, uh, maybe with hundreds of students, knows that that is not the uh, most favorite part of the work you have to do. Um, and uh, yeah, almost 10 years ago, um, I thought, okay, you are, the, you are in NLP, right? So um, that is an NLP, should be doable by NLP. So, uh, let's try to build something that can help my work and maybe also other, uh, also others. And uh, yeah, the um, unfortunate truth is that until this day, it's not really in production. So, and uh, the talk is mainly about why um, this is um, the case. And uh, um, I ask uh, image generation to give me a. Um, picture of a sad teacher, and uh, that is what it came up with. Uh, uh, Hilarious with the third hand, um, and uh, so the um, she will join our story today. Um, and I also asked for a happy teacher because at some point we will see uh, her too, hopefully. Um, yeah. Automating uh, exam scoring in general would not be difficult if we would all do multiple choice right? so that is easy to do but it's not really a choice uh, for pedagogical reasons uh, because it's well known that um, if we, we kind of this format it's very limited and if we have uh, more open-ended responses um, that tests much better what we want to do um, and that's why we want to use free text answers i brought a Example from a well-known data set here. Uh, name one of the three branches of government, and now you have to come up with the answer uh, instead of just recognizing it in the multiple choice. That's a much harder task. And um, so whoever uh, invented that question had three reference answers in mind, uh, judicial branch, executive branch, legislative branch. Um, and if all the students would only answer like this, then again, this would be an easy task, but uh, in the wild, it looks very different. So uh, students give all kinds of answers, like synonyms, and uh, I was not there when we did this, um, and stuff like that, that you have to, to deal with. Um, and uh, of course, people have been working on that problem. Um, I tried to pull out uh, the numbers from the ACL Anthology Explorer, uh, I think this is kind of underestimating because I queried it uh, a bit wrongly, but even if we kind of scale it up by 10 times, uh, um, it's still a relatively small field, so not too many people are working on that, but there, there is quite a lot of things that have been tried, um, and uh, especially there have been like um, challenges and shared tasks, like 2012, the Calculate ASAP challenge that started it, kind of like, and you can see that this was really fundamental in starting it because uh, in 2012 and the years after, that kind of kick-started the, uh, the whole thing. So um, shared tasks and uh, challenges are important for shaping the field, and it's good that also SwissTex and other uh, venues uh, always do that. Uh, and there were kind of other, Semival in 2013 and NAEP in 2012. Um, so it's not a very big field, but stuff has been tried, um, and um, how good do we get? So I quickly ran the numbers uh, on all the questions that I had available, um, and uh, I um, visualized it with this high jumper 
that the, the, this is the ball, where, where's the ball that we have to jump over? Um, and but we see kind of the results are very varied. Um, for some tasks, it's uh, pretty easy. Actually, the question that I just showed you with the three branches of government, it's up there. It's very easy. Um, but there are a lot of others that are um, much harder to do. Um, and the, uh, the, the evaluation metric there that you see, it's uh, QWK. It's a kappa variant uh, quadratically weighted so that if you are grading a student and he deserves a one, uh, a mark one, and you give a five, uh, that is quadratically discounted, so um, as it should be. Um, so, and that means uh, our happy teacher is up there. If it's quality like that, then we might want to use that. But there is quite a lot of questions where the quality is not good enough. Uh, and now one could ask, okay, what is it that makes these questions that hard? Um, and uh, to give you first some intuitive answer, uh, look at these two sets of answers uh, on the left side and on the right side. And as usual, kind of the, uh, we are in the computer mode. We also don't see the question, we just see the answers. Uh, um, and the question is, which one is easier to create? Uh, and most people would say, okay, that on the left side, uh, because here it's so many text, I just don't want to read it. Um, so, and maybe it's the length. Uh, I mean, the field is called short answer scoring uh, sometimes for a reason, kind of because the intuition was always that the length of the answer is uh, fundamental for making this happen or kind of how difficult it is. Um, and I, was, I held this belief too. Uh, it's in an article from a couple of years ago, so I'm guilty. Uh, but then we ran the numbers. Um, and uh, we found that it's actually not really the case. I mean, in the very short answers, you can maybe see a little bit of a trend, but um, in general, it's not just the length, uh, it needs to be something else. And um, we investigated that, um, coming up with a very complicated uh, model of uh, influencing factors that is way too complicated to discuss here and uh, too small. Um, the, important thing I want to focus on is uh, here on the, the lower part that everything that's above, right, so what kind of people are doing the uh, exam and the task type and so on, but it has to pass through the, uh, how the automatic system that we are using operationalizes the task. Uh, so, and if it doesn't know about the question or about the test takers and so on, then it doesn't matter. All that matters is we, see, we are seeing the answers, the responses, and what labels we have. So that is the only thing that the system is seeing. Um, and we are seeing, kind of, and it's of course uh, the system trained on English, it's not that easy to apply to German. We will see cross-lingual results later. Um, but it's probably about the, the variance. And um, we somewhat simplistically um, tried that with type token ratio again. Uh, and uh, at least uh, the fit is a bit better now. Uh, it's still not perfect, so there needs to be something else going on, or we all need to measure variance in a, in a better way. Um, but um, that seems to be the case. Um, so how can we... So um, what factors are uh, influencing the, um, the variance? Um, Apart from some trivial ones, um, um, one that I want to point out is um, that the target population, if you have very early language learners, they make a lot of mistakes so that a lot of the vocabulary that you're seeing is uh, out of vocabulary, and that makes it hard. Um, but we uh, looked at this, and uh, actually most systems, uh, they're using subword embeddings or character biograms or whatever, so they can to some extent deal with that and it's not really a problem. Um, and there is a other factor that reduces the variance, that is that uh, the learner vocabulary is limited, so they don't know a lot of words, so they cannot produce them and that makes it somewhat easier uh, and they're using easier syntax and so on. Um, we also looked at the uh, input modality, for example, in Chinese, um, 
Often you do not uh, type the kind of this different input methods, but you can use this pinion where you're using phonetic input, and then maybe the wrong characters show up. That dramatically increases the variance um, and makes it more uh, difficult. Um, but on the other hand, if the input modality is you're using typing text and uh, you have a spelling correction at directly uh, integrated, then we don't see a lot of spelling mistakes. Um, and of course, the, the task type also influences that. Um, so, for example, the, if the answer can be partly copied from the question, then people will just copy that. And then, of course, it's, uh, you always see these chunks uh, of text that are correct in the, um, in the answers, and then it's uh, easier um, to score. Um, so, um, now that we have identified that, um, um, there is a lot of variance, and um, that's why um, a typical learning curve looks like that. Uh, um, so you start, if you train the system in a supervised fashion with a kind of really bad performance, and then you get gradually better. And you see here, in this uh, one of the data sets, we have 1,800 answers, and um, yeah, you need quite a lot, and it starts to plateau around 500. Um, that is the typical um, curve that we see. But of course, this makes our teachers sad again, um, because they don't want to create 1,800 answers. Uh, if I go to the uh, university and tell them, okay, um, even in a course at the Fern University, where we sometimes have 5,000 students in the psychology course, um, even then, uh, uh, if I tell them, okay, if you create the first 2,000, uh, then I can help you with the next 3,000. Um, it's not that ideal, and in many cases, we only have 500. So, um, it's, so we need to create everything, and then we have a model, and then the teachers, as you might know, they tell me, yeah, but we can't reuse the task, because once it, we have done it, it's burned, uh, the students, maybe in five years or so, but not next year. Um, so, yeah. Actually, kind of the teachers would be more happy on that side. And uh, what I am arguing is that um, um, where research is usually focused on uh, is this side. So you download the data set from the, um, from the hub or whatever, um, and then you run your supervised experiments uh, and you put some percentage points on the quality of the model. Um, the teachers don't care about that. They want you to research on that side. And um, um, I hope that I can, in the remaining time of the talk today, convince you that this is an interesting um, area to work in. Um, of course, people have been looking into also that area. Um, and um, um, one thing that has been tried was active learning. Um, so especially my colleague, uh, Andrea Horbach, uh, was active in that field. Um, and um, so first we um, log scale the x-axis so that we actually can see what is going on. Uh, um, and then uh, we put some kind of uh, rails on that because the, if it matters quite a lot, uh, especially if you have a small number of samples, how you sample, right? So you can, you can be really bad uh, if you use the wrong samples, but you can actually also get pretty good with seven samples if we only knew which ones to use. <laughs> so, and uh, um, that is surprisingly hard to do, and uh, the active learning results, they always look a bit like that, so um, we put a little bit, or we go a little bit ahead of the, the curve, but not nearly enough for this to be um, um, useful. So, um, if I tell the teachers, okay, you don't have to grade 500, but only 410, they are still not very happy. Right? Um, okay, so maybe, or, or we did something wrong, and um, you can do much better, but um, it's surprisingly hard. Next thing we tried was clustering. So, the idea was that Maybe we can cluster the, the answers into kind of, this is a other task now, but you can, similar 
in spirit uh, of what we have seen before. And then the idea is that the teachers, they look at the clusters and they say, ah, okay, this is all the right answers and here, and um, because I have to do fewer number of grading steps, hopefully it's quicker. So, and we ran a simulation study. Uh, again, this is a different task. That's why the curves look uh, uh, a bit uh, different, but Again, this is log x axis, uh, and the simulation looks very nice. So with the clusters, we get as close to the ideal condition as possible. Um, okay, I cherry picked that. There were other uh, charts that look not nearly as nice as this, but um, okay, there are um, there are uh, situations where it is working. Um, so, but. There is kind of like a problem in, in the real world uh, that the clusters look like this. This is the, exa the longer example that we have been seen before. And now, if you look at that and I ask you, is this a good cluster? Can you, are this all correct answers? It's not easy to, to say. And, uh, and we ran the experiment um, with the teachers and it, uh, where we only showed them the clusters. And it turned out that uh, with the clusters, it actually took longer and they made more mistakes than when creating sequentially um, in a lot of conditions. Right? So if the clusters are kind of trivial, then it's fine. Uh, but for, for many, many of the, in the lower part of the distribution that we have seen with the set teacher, um, that is unfortunately not a good solution. But they, and even if the clusters are correct, right? so, and sometimes they, they are, uh, but still, the teacher has to understand what is going on uh, um, to make an informed decision. Okay, that is also not working. So maybe another thing that we tried was uh, confidence-based scoring. It was also uh, proposed quite a while ago. They say, okay, um, if the classifier outputs a confidence threshold, maybe we can say, um, if you make that dense enough, uh, so only, we only scored a very confident answers. Um, maybe that saves us some time in, uh, for the set teacher. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, there were two problems. Uh, one was uh, it's not easy to generalize this threshold. Um, so it does not generalize very well from one task to another. So we need, again, training data to find thresholds. Um, nothing really uh, one here. And the other thing is that if you, like the, this makes a quite, quite strong assumption that every creating decision takes the same amount of time, but actually it's there's easy ones and hard ones, uh, and you take a lot more time on the hard ones uh, than on the easy ones. And the ones that the classifier has high confidence on, they're not the easy ones. So you're not saving a lot of time doing that when you try it in a, in a practical setting. Uh, and of course, we tried LLMs, uh, so how couldn't we? Um, and uh, for, especially in a zero shot, but we also tried a few shots, and the results look very similar, that for some easy data sets, you can get results that are quite close, uh, but that is again the data set that was already kind of easy to do anyway. And for the others, uh, that we tried the zero shot and few shot results look not very promising. Uh, but uh, um, the, we did not do this extensively. Kind of, that's really kind of going to be presented next week uh, at the Muckle workshop. Um, and probably we could have done better prompts, more in context learning, whatever. Um, and maybe this is going somewhere, but we have to keep in mind that. Um, we are optimizing for time spent by the teacher, and of course they are grading experts, not prompt writing experts. Or kind of, uh, so we have to find a way that it's really kind of a fixed setup, and that they don't don't need to do a lot of additional stuff. Okay, um, that is a good uh, moment for me to take a sip of water, mm -hmm. and uh, to the, and for you to lean back and say, okay. What I have told you in the last 10 minutes, um, 
was nothing works um, in this uh, supervised fashion. We are not really getting closer to the um, making the teacher happy. Um, but now let's assume we found some magic way, and I mean, or magic, or hopefully someone is in the audience who can uh, solve the problem or give me some tips. But um, let's assume we are doing that. Then we are done, right? So then nothing uh, can go wrong. Uh, uh, wrong. Um, we tried this, um, and one thing that pops up is uh, automation bias. Um, so even if we have a very good classifier, uh, um, if the teachers trust the system, um, they just accept the machine decision. So it's very hard for the teachers to say, okay, uh, I have this meta competence of knowing when the classifier is wrong. Right? So, uh, that, that's very hard to do. Um, or they don't trust the classifier at all. So, and then there are no savings. Um, yeah, so it's surprisingly hard to use the classification result that we have in a, in a way that really helps the teachers save time. What you can do, and that is also kind of like a, uh, a benefit is you can do this as a kind of consistency check. Uh, we routinely now run a planning classifier like that if we have it already uh, um, um, as a double check for the grades that the teachers give. And if there's some uh, difference, they can look again and we can show that the grades get more consistent with a, a panel of experts, um, but we don't save any time. So it's a, actually, it takes more time because now you have to, after the grading, the computer comes to you and says, okay, now you have to look at 10% of the things again because we tell you that maybe there's something wrong. So uh, instead of time saved, it's 10% more time now. Um, so that is a problem. Um, how do we actually, kind of, if we have the system, how can we make it happen? Another system uh, problem is if we introduce an automated system, uh, we invite people to cheat and to be adversarial. Uh, so um, this is a, a different type of question and answer. And here we tested a, a different range of adversaries, like random characters. Right? That's, Probably teacher, uh, students will not do this, uh, it's, but it's uh, interesting, kind of you can see here in the title of the paper, uh, what a classifier sometimes accepts as correct. Um, and we tested some more kind of random words, like just writing everything, uh, all content words that you can come up with, uh, shuffle the answer, and uh, also kind of GPT generated answers. and. Uh, Across the board, uh, up to 60% of the answers uh, get accepted. Um, and of course, that makes our student happy. So I introduced a new character here. Um, because now they can, and it's uh, surprisingly hard to uh, harden the system against these cheating attempts. Um, so that is also not so good. Another very important thing is explainability. So, and I introduce a new character, the angry student. Uh, you might know him if you are in academia. Um, and um, so I put out an answer here. Uh, um, and uh, if you create it correctly, then the students are happy and they will never come back to you. But if you say it's wrong, then immediately they will ask why. Uh, so, I think my answer is correct. And now you have to come up with an explanation. Um, and sure, you can show them some kind of color-coded triple values or whatever and say, okay, here, yeah, you certainly understand why uh, from looking at this, why your answer is uh, wrong. Yeah, of course not, we need a um, pedagogically correct explanation um, that actually kind of would have to uh, take into account a model of the knowledge of the student, uh, because depending on kind of where I stand with my knowledge, I need a different explanation of why this is wrong or not. So uh, that is a surprisingly hard problem. Um, and um, yeah, and that also is maybe a, the need for explainability is kind of bad news for using LLMs uh, because maybe 
the explainability of these models is not that high. Um, one thing that we tried to improve the explainability a bit is to use uh, similarity-based scoring um, where you have uh, reference answers uh, and instead of training a classifier over the answers, you learn the similarity that needs to be between a single reference answer and the, the learner answer. Um, and the, the nice thing is it has a little bit of built-in explainability because you can always say, okay, this is correct or wrong because it, your answer is similar to a known correct or known wrong answer, depending on the similarity. And sometimes it's, um, um, there needs to be the most similar one. So uh, then it comes back to the thresholds again that we have seen earlier, but at least there is some um, built-in explainability. And you also need a surprisingly small number of reference answers to make that happen. Um, unfortunately, uh, you need still some um, in the range of 50 uh, to get good performance in the similarity. But um, we use this um, to uh, win the grand prize uh, in the 2022 NAEP challenge. I'm not too proud of that because the, result, the results were really, really bad. So really, really bad. But I mean, they were the best of a lot of really, really bad results. So, and then you win. Right? So, uh, but still, it, it was for the generic model that can with zero shot apply to other things. Um, but yeah, still a long way to go. Um, another nice property, what we found of this model is that we applied it in a cross-lingual setting, um, where you see here on the main diagonal that uh, um, these all darker shades uh, and the others is applying the same model via um, machine translation or some joint embedding space uh, to the other languages. And you see kind of like the uh, hmm, performance decrease is quite, quite big, but uh, with the similarity-based model, it's uh, uh, much better. Um, we are still kind of, it's also kind of uh, uh, not even accepted yet. Um, so, what of the press results? So, we are still exploring why this is actually the case and so on. Um, and the data that we use this on, it's from the, from the Peerless program. Um, it's totally confidential and we cannot share it, uh, unfortunately. Um, but it's the only data set where you have so many languages and it's actually the same. Uh, task and it's a controlled setting, so uh, where you can say, okay, it is only the language and not that the test population was totally different or it's totally different questions and so on. Okay, um, so maybe this is the solution. You might think, not so fast. Um, I asked image generation to generate the image of a random EU bureaucrat. That's what came up. Um, and uh, the, um, in the AI Act that we also heard of uh, yesterday, um, scoring, evaluating learning outcomes, including those used to steer the student's learning process, is high risk. Um, so not 100% sure what that will mean for uh, the field moving forward. So. That is something kind of, even if you have a system and it works very well and teachers are happy, you have to deal with regulation um, and uh, you have to deal with data privacy. So again, I asked the uh, image generation to come up with a uh, um, university data protection officer. Um, I don't know why he has a face, um, but um, so I learned when doing this at Fanuni that I'm uh, not allowed to call any external APIs uh, and send the data there. Um, so that means and this includes all LLMs and that's why we are running our own open source LLM server at, uh, now so that the student answers don't get outside of the boundaries of the university. That might be another practical um, problem that you have to deal with. Um, okay, so maybe kind of I'm skipping that um, for time reasons. Um, now that we have done all that, uh, um, maybe we have made the 
the EU bureaucrats and the data protection office are happy. Maybe now we are done. Um, yeah, maybe. The, um, we found another problem that can you actually trust your gold standards? Um, and um, there was one task that we tried to score. It's a listening comprehension task. So um, the task goes like this. Uh, um, there is a dialogue that, that you listen to. Uh, hey, Alice, do you have time this afternoon? Sure, Bob, let's meet at the library. Um, and then there's a, afterwards a reading comprehension question that asks, where do Alice and Bob plan to meet in the afternoon? And then students have to write the answer. Um, um, and um, because they only hear it uh, as a library would be the expected answer. And because they only hear the, uh, the dialogue, uh, they will write down all kind of phonetic stuff. Uh, uh, Library, library, liberal, libre, uh, um, and quite quite a lot of kind of like really misunderstanding, like in the cafeteria or some other uh, entities that were mentioned in the dialogue. Uh, um, and but we were very interested in this kind of spelling variance because our grading experts uh, that really looked into that, um, they had very strong opinions about which of the spe obvious spelling libraries of uh, spelling variants of library are acceptable and are not acceptable. And we had a still ongoing discussion with them what criteria they actually use to make this distinction. And it's surprisingly hard. And they came up with all kinds of, okay, we do this because this is too close to an existing world. This is, for example, uh, um, one of the, the reasons they give. And then we actually ran the numbers uh, with a computer and say, okay, but then you should also not accept this because it's also close to this word. And say, ah, okay, I didn't think about that. Uh, um, and uh, so we, in the paper, we try to come up with like a um, algorithmic decision when the spelling variant kind of like that we can have an explainable model that says, okay, the added distance to a known word has to be lower than this and so on. So that it's actually um, kind of model that we can operationalize in some way, and it's not just a gut feeling of um, the teachers. That is surprisingly odd. Um, and um, another thing that we have to take consider is that we have to deal with input modalities. So if everything is already typed, then it's relatively easy, but um, we have handwriting and speech. Um, Maybe handwriting is solved now and from after the talk yesterday. I'm not so sure, uh, but um, it's uh, important uh, input modality or even multimodal stuff um, that might um, um, that we might want to score. And uh, I want to focus on, on handwriting for a minute because um, this is a real sample from uh, one of our handwriting studies. Um, it's not very easy to read, I must say. Um, and um, if you have done any grading of handwritten stuff, um, the cognitive load of deciphering uh, hundreds of different handwritings, it's, it's not, um, it, it's very hard. And even kind of before we go to the scoring uh, part, um, we can do kind of a lot of uh, reducing this cognitive effort by just showing a transcript of the what uh, in a digital form um, type form from the handwriting preserving the layout of the handwriting as much as possible so that you know where to look and then people can just read this and sometimes look to the handwriting and we can show that they are much 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 faster if they only and and they are faster and they feel better right? which is also important for the happy teacher to emerge um, so this is what we do and um, another but the hand kind of the, the error rate is still could be better so that's why I'm really curious to see where the online handwriting thing is uh, is going in the future um, what we also do is personalization uh, because here we see different versions of how you can write scientific um, and uh, it would be helpful to know the handwriting of the individual students and actually what we do on the first page of the of the exam we let them write a, a set of words that we 
partly pull from the from the tasks and partly select for uh, character combinations that we combinations that we know are uh, important to get right. Um, so that we have a handwriting example, and then we use this for tuning the model for each student. And that um, so brings down the error rate quite a lot. So this is the, each, each of the lines is one student uh, and teacher, because we also participated in the thing ourselves. Um, and you see the character error rate is sometimes like close to 50%, which is horrible. And it goes down quite a lot to still 20%, which is still way too much, but it's much better. And um, actually this worst line here, uh, that's my handwriting. So, <laughs> and that's why I'm a computer scientist, so that I never have to handwrite again, um, because nobody can read it. Um, and another thing that we looked at in the modality space is images, uh, because in a lot of tasks, you not just have uh, a question, but you have a question that references the image. Like, right? okay, look at this chart, look at this image, tell us what's going on. And uh, of course, there are some um, very capable um, visual linguistic models, uh, but they have some interesting failure modes. For example, we looked, uh, my student Marie looked at uh, uh, prepositions. Uh, so, um, and you can imagine if you take that to the kind of look at this chart, uh, what is the kind of um, the bar left to the green bar or whatever. So if the model cannot really understand prepositions, especially spatial ones, that would be bad for um, understanding the, the model. And we show that the prepositions are hard. Um, and we also look at other things in a systematic way, for example, color, and also show that uh, the color perception of the models uh, does not really match the human color perception. Um, and that is also a problem for kind of like, um, if I look at a chart and I say, um, the green bar, uh, and you all know maybe it's blue, um, depends on lighting conditions and uh, what you consider blue or green. So that is hard, so we need to carefully uh, adjust for that. And um, that is uh, another thing where we look at. So, um, but um, then you can kind of have tasks that have questions and images and you still be able to um, have a good model for that. Okay. Um, that already um, brings me to the conclusion. So we have seen that it's not easy to build a system that does the right thing. So I'm arguing that too much research for my taste is going on in that space. And I'm in sense kind of motivating you to uh, work on that hard problem of um, um, getting good models with at the, the minimal amount of training data possible so that we can make the teacher happy. Um, but I hope um, that I have also explained that even if we had a very good model, uh, there is still, uh, so the, um, we are jumping over the bar of kind of whatever uh, performance we want to have. Um, the, um, um, there are other factors, um, need for feedback, legal constraints, costs, uh, ethical constraints, runtime, whatever, kind of some of that I have not mentioned here. Um, and all these stakeholders that are angry or happy, depending on what you do, that you also have to take into account. And uh, I argue that this is mainly um, why uh, it's not in the classroom yet to the extent that it could be. Um, so because also the performance is not everything, you have to really try it in a practical setting to see what else can go wrong. Um, and um, the, um, um, one of the things um, that I think we could do better is this oper operationalization of the whole thing. Um, because if we just treat it as a supervised learning task that looks only at the answers, um, it seems a bit limited. Huh? So we have so many factors um, that uh, the systems are ignoring. So if you look at the happy teacher system, uh, 
it's a system that we pre-train for 18 years and then fine-tune for five years in the university to be able to do a very complicated task of grading. And then they can actually do it, not by looking at 2,000 answers, but by we tell them the question and some grading guidelines and then just do it. And that, that would be kind of my vision of where we need to go, um, that we need to take more varied inputs about the question, about the setting, um, about the guidelines, about where, what we actually want with the grading into account. Um, and now we are deriving that implicitly from the answers, um, but I'm not sure if that's actually um, the best way for the future. And um, that's why I felt a bit sad when I did that in the train. Um, but as you can see now, I'm, I've recovered. Um, I um, hope that you um, have kind of now a better feeling for this very interesting task, I think. And uh, yeah, thank you. That's it. for this very interesting talk. Are there any questions? The, um, the modality of the task, you say? Um, yeah. Um, so, first of all, let me challenge the, the, the premise. Um, often we are not free to do that. Uh, so, um, the, um, for example, the hand that the, the thing, the exams are still handwritten, is that um, um, if you do it online, in a, a kind of like online, then people cheat. If you do it, digital in presence, then all the computers crash. <laughs> Is that the safest way, kind of the teachers say, it's the safest way for me to do it in a meaningful fashion. Um, so maybe you are not free to change the input. Model. But if you could, uh, and that's what you're asking, um, yeah, then I think a kind of um, um, typed answer is uh, already quite good. Um, 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 I, I don't want the handwriting if I, if I don't need to, uh, um, I'm so I don't know what to say. Kind of, if there is anything, what, what we need is more the metadata. Like, um, do we know anything about the student? Uh, what is the task? Uh, what is the answers to similar task? And to have more like an ecosystem of, of things. But um, beyond that, I cannot easily imagine something. That, yeah, yes and no. Um, that has been done, uh, but it's a bit questionable from the uh, from an ethical perspective um, because it should not influence. I mean, it, it has been shown that if you do that, you can grade with a much higher uh, accuracy because, of course, the previous quality is somewhat uh, indicative of the uh, future performance. But uh, um, it's unfair for the students. Um, and there was kind of in Corona some kind of thing where they, I think it was in the UK, where they said, okay, we can't have the uh, final exam, so we will just have an algorithm that computes the final score by whatever you had until that point. And no, we can't do that. So the, 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 we need the test to see what your performance at this point is. And maybe you improved dramatically from the last time because you studied harder. Um, so it's, um, it, it, it has been tried and it works, but um, I would take a quite strong stance that that is not a solution we should try to pursue. Yes. Yeah. 
there, of, of course, the grading rubric needs to be different for, for every task. And um, one of the important thing is that you actually have one. So that is um, not always the case. Uh, and that you are explicit about what you actually expect the answers to be. And um, if you go into the university, um, as I said, it would be good if you had one, uh, but not kind of, uh, there's a very, only very few uh, that have that beforehand, but very often they say, I will look at the answers first, and then I will come up with whatever counts as a correct or wrong answer. Uh, I, I don't invest that time beforehand. So that happens also very often. And of course, it needs to be different for kind of the same answer for kindergarten and the university student gets a different grade, right? And it gets graded for different reasons. Do we ignore spelling errors um, or are they actually part of what the construct that we are trying to understand that that makes all the difference? So, um, maybe back there first. Yeah, I'm not sure if I 100% understood the question, so I'll try to repeat. Uh, so you asked about the generic model, yeah. or yeah, uh, in, in what way it is generic? Um, yeah, also it, it should be generic in the way what I said in uh, the um, the teacher that we train for from a long time. That is a generic model. Uh, um, it can adapt to a new task very easily um, without having to be fine-tuned again on quite a lot of supervised data. And in that way, we want a model that um, we can apply to a new task, maybe a similar task that we have seen before. Right? If it's too much out of distribution, it gets also difficult for the teachers, but that we can, we don't need to retrain every time. Um, and uh, what, what does it take to adapt it to the new task? Um, that, that, that is the question, but it cannot be fully generic, so also it, it needs to have some input about the task, otherwise it's not. But ideally, just the question and the creating rubric. Um, you talked about the sentence comparison. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so, can you repeat the last part? The so short answers get lower scores, or let's say you um, as a well, give a really short answer, which may be correct from the mm -hmm. but still compared to the um, uh, ideal answers, it's more the cheapest, most okay. Um, so. We tested different strategies for accounting um, for the imbalance in, in the length between reference answers and student answers. Uh, we didn't find a lot of difference. Um, and also, I, I, I need to look into the details again, but I cannot remember that we found some kind of uh, significant bias for long or shorter answers. Um, but it's a, it's a good point to, to investigate explicitly. But I, I have to look into the details. Okay, so. How do you set the lower answers? Well, the, or when do you say the answer is not correct? I think the, um, um, maybe let me go back to the uh, similarity thing. Um, the, um, oh, too many slides. Um, because we're using these reference answers and they are already, um, so there are some that are correct, some are partially correct, with uh, maybe feedback you the, this or that is missing, and so on. And um, we give the grade uh, for uh, that corresponds to the answer that has the highest similarity to the learner answer. So, and with that, we don't need a threshold. But whatever gets the highest gets the the grade. So you just need a bigger number. Maybe. 
Now, the, the, the interesting thing is if the similarity method is, is, is pretty good, you need only a very low number of these reference answers. So um, hopefully the similarity method accounts for all the metalinguistic stuff like uh, paraphrases and uh, active passive and stuff like that. But you need to have kind of a reference answer for every structurally different answer, right? So if there, there could be kind of like, you can argue this from this perspective and from that perspective, and then you need a reference answer for each of these kind of uh, high level different answers. But then the similarity method uh, that pre-trained, uh, that takes care of all the um, linguistic variants that you can find. And, and that's why the, 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 we find that the number of reference answers that you actually need is surprisingly low. Uh, and it works very often uh, quite good. Um, only when, they answer, when they, they, the student answers and the reference answers get too long, um, then it's very hard to find a good similarity function. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, at least there is a little bit of explainability, I would say. So, um, in that the, 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 ex the explanation is, you wrote this, uh, and we gave you uh, half the points because your answer is closest to this answer uh, that we think is structurally equivalent to what you wrote, and. That was worth half the points, and that's why you get this. And then you can still argue, yeah, but my answer is different in this and that way, and that should give me more points and so on. Uh, but it's at least it's uh, attempt for um, an explanation, and um, it's better than saying, yeah, our black box classifier said it's wrong. So that is that is the or kind of like the you have to look at the weights of the classifier, or whatever, so which is not a good explanation, and you can generate post hoc explanations and the sad truth about if you asked the teachers how they do it um, like you graded this a month ago now the student comes into the office and asks you why do you give me zero points um, it's also post hoc rationalization so you look at it and uh, you say okay mm, I, I have to make up some I don't know why I have to retrace my reasoning steps um, and, um, and and there is some kind of uh, works that try, I think, a similar thing, and they say, okay, whatever the classifier did, now we ask LLM to uh, generate um, an explanation that might have nothing to do with the action and reasoning process that led to this score. Uh, um, also not ideal. Um, I'm very bad at looking in the future, um, but um, I would say that the, um, the testing formats that we use, uh, they are always um, um, yeah, a trade-off between the effort we can spend and the, uh, what we want to test. And probably, uh, we had this discussion before, uh, oral exams would probably be better uh, in I mean, not for everyone. So we know, for example, that some people are very bad in oral exams and they are better in, for psychological reasons in written exams, and that would kind of uh, put them in a disadvantage. Uh, but for figuring out if people actually know the topic, a uh, dialogue would be good. And I could imagine that um, if there was um, um, like the agent that you could have a dialogue with, the part of the um, kind of, if you really wanted to automate it, a better way would probably have chat with this uh, uh, bot for half an hour, and then it will tell you kind of uh, your grade. But still, this would be fully automated. Uh, it would probably be forbidden under the AI Act. Um, and um, yeah, it, I'm, I'm not sure if I would trust the automated system too much at this point. And if it's not fully automated, 
then I'm not on it. Then I, I don't see a good way forward how this would save any time for the teachers. Okay. You said that uh, you think that smaller number of records are faster. Yeah. Um, more is relative. Um, the details are in the paper, and it's of course the more the better. Uh, um, but um, we tested three, five, seven reference answers per um, per class, so to say, uh, um, and um, that worked reasonably well. So, um, and if you have like five. Um, labels uh, and say seven per label, then it would put you in the 35 um, to 50 answers range. That, that, that is where we wanted to go. And um, the, the good thing about the reference answer based thing is that often you have these like uh, binary scale and say, okay, it's correct or it's wrong. And the, it's, it's correct for one reason and it can be wrong for a lot of reasons, right? Um, that is kind of uh, in general. Um, um, and then you can have like a um, more fine grained inventory of reference also that this is a misconception that often happens uh, that is wrong for the reason. And then you can even attach a feedback message to the reference answers and say, okay, when it's similar to this answer, then the, explain it, the, the feedback that we give the student for getting better is, okay, uh, you probably misunderstood that this concept is not the same as this, uh, um, and that's why you got no points, but this is the feedback we give you. And then there can be other uh, answers like, I don't know, uh, I wasn't there, and so on, which is a class of its own, um, where we say, okay, next time better attend the lecture. So um, this... Um, more fine-grained thing, and, and the teachers uh, that can give you uh, feedback, and the teachers are actually quite okay with preparing this because they feel uh, much more in control and um, have the feeling that they are doing the, the something for the good of the student. Uh, so they're and investing time in this. They, yeah, they, they kind of like to do much more than grading 200 more answers. Um, um, so that's why we found this to be kind of, for the time being, um, what we usually do now for preparing this, um, because teachers are most happy with it. But whatever you can, if you have good ideas, uh, how this, how you can make me unsad again, uh, um, then yeah, please tell me. I'm curious to hear your ideas. Um, also at the coffee break later. Thank you, Thorsten, for your excellent presentation. Thank you.